All right, so we're going to get started. It's a little after six. Um, welcome, everybody, to uh, Philadelphia PowerShell User Group. Uh, my name is Lito. This is uh, John. And we're uh, extremely excited today to have uh, Jeff Hicks with us. Uh, we won't take up too much time and let Jeff dive in, but take, what, take whatever you need. Um, <laughs> Jeff is a uh, Microsoft uh, MVP in uh, Windows PowerShell. He's a, a certified technical trainer, um, author of several books. Um, all good. All very good books. And, yeah, that's um, what we've heard. As luck would have it, he brought some to raffle off later on uh, at the end of uh, tonight's talk. So looking forward to that. Um, he must be ready to win. He must be here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, John, you wanted to mention something real quick? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, let me I forget who mentioned it, but somebody was having issues with uh, pulling DNS records uh, via PowerShell. I think they were trying to use NS Lookup and trying to uh, pull strings out of that. Uh, Scripting Guy actually had a post on uh, January 8th. Um, actually had to use, um, I think, a combination of CMI and WMI uh, to actually pull that information out. Uh, we'll post it on our blog rolls in case whoever is here um, Whoever mentioned last meeting was not here because I'm not here today to uh, give that information. But because they interested, we can do that. Um, do you want to mention Interface or IT? Yeah, we wanted to uh, to thank Interface Technical Training uh, for sponsoring uh, tonight's event. Um, certainly helps to have wonderful sponsors like Interface. So if you're in need, if your company's in need of uh, online training, they have an awesome uh, uh, website set up um, and excellent training for. Uh, for a multitude of things for IT pros, so definitely check them out. Yeah, you know, actually they have a decent model. I was actually looking at it uh, today. They have a little tidbits, a lot of their um, videos on there. Um, so at the very least, I say take a look at their blog and take, um, take a look at some of their entries. There's some pretty good stuff. Yeah, we'll put links to all that uh, in the in our blog post following this meeting. So without further ado, thank you, Jeff. Right, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming up, it's always uh, good to see a, a turnout of, of IT pros. I've been to a number of user groups and it's always a challenge, I think, for the IT pro side to get people to come to user group meetings. Mm -hmm. Developer types seem to, I've been to developer-oriented user groups, and they always have people there. But I think maybe because you guys spend most of your days maybe putting out fires and when the day's over, you just say, I've got enough and I want to go home. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking the time to, to come out. Uh, tonight, for the next hour, hour or so, until someone throws me and says, hey, that's enough, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about scripting advanced functions with Windows PowerShell. And I'm sure some of you are kind of in a variety of states in your PowerShell so hopefully <clears throat> some of the stuff I'll go over will be new to you. Uh, try to give you some tips on how to take your PowerShell scripting kind of up to the next level. So I have a short little agenda, uh, lots of demo, I and mean, I can talk about this sort of stuff, you know, forever and ever. So it'll be a challenge trying to kind of keep ourselves on task here. So real quickly, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my own Windows PowerShell MVP, I'm an MCT, I'm a, an independent author, trainer, <coughs> consultant, so one of the things I do is I go around and I offer training to people, uh, or I make training videos like I do for TrainSignal. I've written a number of books, uh, the list, current list is there on the slide. Um, I blog quite a bit, I'm also on Twitter, and also on Google+. Plus. I don't have the Google Plus thing up there, but uh, some of you follow me on Twitter, so you can test that. I probably tweet way more than I, I should. Test that. <laughs> I appreciate everyone who follows me and who interacts with me because, in fact, I would like more of that. So I don't feel like I'm necessarily just tweeting into <laughs> a void. And get an echo some, chamber? Yeah, give me some validation. <laughs> Because I just work at home and it's just me sitting in front of a computer and um, so actually Twitter is my office, really. So that's sometimes I gotta turn it off so I can actually get some work done, but that's my office. So my uh, name's up there. Alright, so scripts or functions. <clears throat> you all know that there's no difference between 
running a command in PowerShell, or a series of commands, and scripting, right? Whenever you type at the PowerShell prompt, you can copy and paste that into a PowerShell script, the PS1 extension, save the script, assuming your execution policy allows running scripts, and execute. A function is just a variation on that. So there's no difference between an interactive session and a script and scripting. When I first started writing PowerShell books, I kind of had to decide, are my, are my demos going to be scripts or are they going to be functions? Because functions live within scripts. What I've come to conclude is that there's nothing wrong with a standalone script. And I say this because I have a number of these scripts that in essence are a canned PowerShell session, if you will. Because I need to do test X, Y, and Z, and I need to repeat it. So instead of me having to type those commands all the time, I just can put them in a script. So a standalone script, without any functions or anything, although they can have functions, is great for repetitive task sequences, especially if it's something that you want to hand off to someone else so you can go on vacation. So let's say every morning I come in and I need to query the event logs on 10 different servers, I need to check the status of 10 different services and whatever else that you might need to do in the morning. So there's separate little things that normally you would sit down and bang out on the keyboard. Well now, I can just take those same things, let me bang it out in PowerShell at the keyboard, put those same things in the script, run the script. Great. If I have to go, if I'm homesick or I'm on vacation, then person covering for me, all they have to do is run the script, it's consistent, it's documented, perfect. Where I get to using functions is where I'm gonna start building basically a tool. Something where I want to modularize that work. So let's say um, I need to query those 10 event logs and I'm only looking for specific servers that I kind of want to customize the output a little bit, well, I might build my own function to handle that task for me. And then maybe I might put that function in my script. Functions primarily have to exist in a script in order to use them, although they don't have to, because you, I'm sure you moment you can find a function right from the PowerShell prompt. So scripts stand alone, think like a canned PowerShell session. It's basically playback of commands that you typed. Functions allow you to modularize, so don't confuse that with don't confuse that with modules, but allow you to componentize, if that's such a word, um, something that you, you want to do. Consoles can live in script files, but you can define them at the console. So you can define you know, really quick and dirty functions right within the console. So if I want to create a function like get OS, and you can call it whatever you want. You know, I'm going to talk about naming conventional stuff in a moment. If you're creating an ad hoc function that you're using in the shell, and it's going to be thrown away, who cares about the naming convention? Because you're the only one that's going to use it. It's going to go away as soon as your PowerShell session is gone. So don't worry about naming conventions. But you can include parameters and lots of other stuff. You can include aliases. You don't have to follow any of the best practices when you do it this way. Because the whole point is you want to quickly type this. So now I have a function called get OS, which is going to return the caption property of the Win32 operating system class on some computer. And maybe you just want to, you have an idea for something, and this is a quick way to test it out. I mean, we're actually going to use this example and build on it. So functions you can build right from the prompt. Now, once that's loaded, I can then, as long as the session's open, type get OS, the name of the computer, and get my result. Doesn't have to live in a script file, but typically they do. We then integrate these functions that we've developed into modules or our standalone scripts, like I just said. So some of you, I'm expecting, have built basic functions. 
these are intended, again, to be repeatable. The whole point of, of a function is I'm going to do something, maybe customize it, and it is repeatable, and it's going to write some result to the pipeline. It doesn't have to be customizable. You don't have to add any parameters to it, although typically you do, because you need to give it usually some value, something that you want to do, like connect to a computer or search an event log. It's, they can be used kind of as shortcuts. So you can put in default values. So let's say I want to query you know, this, this uh, event log. And I always want to get you know, the last 10 security <coughs> entries and the last 20 errors for application and system event log. Now, in PowerShell version 3, we have default parameter values, which help with some of that. But leaving that aside, you might build a function that has those values built in so that for the most part, nine times out of 10, you just run the function, boom, you get what you want without having to type all of those parameters, but it's customized. So maybe today, you know what, I think I need to check this other log or get different errors, and you have it customized with parameters. I'll show, we'll show that. Functions should only do one thing. Scripts, on the other hand, remember, it's like a canned session. So I can do as many different things as I want. Functions should be like commandlets, small, single task. And then the last thing about basic functions, actually functions in general, is think about writing objects to the pipeline. I see a lot of scripts that people write, and I can always tell where they're coming from based on how they produce their output. I'm not a big fan of return. So if I see return, I know where that person has come from. I know what background they have. You, nine times out of 10, return works just fine, but it's just, it's the paradigm of you're not returning a value. Your function should be writing an object or objects to the pipeline. So that's what you always want to be thinking about, writing objects to the pipeline. So here is our function that I had done ad hoc before a little more fleshed out. So we have the function keyword, the name of the function, then you have a set of open and closed curly braces. PowerShell doesn't really care the positioning of those curly braces. Some people like to put that opening curly brace on the next line, whatever works for you. I then have a parameter. In this case, I just have a single parameter computer name. I've given it a default value. Now, one thing here on default values, especially for computer names. I'm not a big fan of localhost, and I'm not a big fan of the period. That's because if I <clears throat> am running this function and I'm saving this output to look at later, and the output for computer names is localhost, well, what machine was that on? Or if it's period, what machine was that on? And there are some things that you can get into where localhost or the period won't work. I prefer to use the system variable for computer name. This will always return the actual net BIOS name of the computer. So don't use localhost. Take the time actually have it, if you want it to default to the local computer, have it default to a real computer name. Anyway, because okay, so there's my little spiel on that. I then run get my object for the class, computer name, and then I write the output. I could use write, or I could just do $data.caption, which all of those, those three things will all write the object. In this case, it's just a string, and yeah, that's okay. Maybe not so great because it, there's more information that I might want to get. But all I care about is the caption, so it's something like Windows 8. <coughs> professional or Windows Server 2012, that's what the, the caption will show. So there's kind of a basic function. Nothing wrong with that, it works. <clears throat> and I'm expecting a lot of you have probably written or tried to write you know, simple functions like that. 
and start with that. Don't feel the stuff I'm going to get into that you need to jump into right away. I'm going to show you a bunch of things that you can eventually use, but don't feel you have to use everything we'll show you all at once. Build up to it. So an advanced function then has a number of things that define it as advanced. One is this thing called commandlet binding. And we'll, I'll show you how that works. When PowerShell sees that commandlet binding, it treats that entire function like a commandlet, which gives you all sorts of cool bells and whistles. For example, I get support for all the common parameters, like dash verbose. <clears throat> I can include parameter sets. So if I have six parameters, but two of them have to belong, I can only use these two, these are mutually exclusive, I can build two parameter sets and have them each in their own parameter set. You've seen this. You run the help like for get child item, and you see three different ways to run it. Well, those are three different parameter sets. You can do that same thing in your advanced function. Uh, you can add support for dash what if. With an advanced function, I can now accept pipeline input. My basic function, if I had a bunch of computers I wanted to get that, use that get OS, I'd have to pipe them to four each and then call the function and pass computer name. Nothing wrong with that, but maybe I want to make this more like a commandlet and have be able to do get contact computers.txt and pipe it to my function. Well, I can do that with an advanced function. I can use parameter validation. I can verify that they that what they put in is what I'm expecting. Say matches a particular pattern that it's not null or empty. If it fails at validation, then PowerShell will throw an exception right off the bat, which I'd much rather have. I don't want to get halfway through my function in the middle of reconfiguring something and have the function blow up because I didn't validate a parameter and it said, oh, no, I can't use this. I don't want that. I'd much rather have everything know that it's going to work before I start doing stuff. And then we typically have comment-based help with our commands. So you can, with our functions, because they act like commands, so I can do help, you know, get OS, and it will show me complete help, syntax, examples, you can do online help, all that stuff. So the structure that we're looking at, and this is the structure that I kind of follow. It's not necessarily the only way that you can do this. So I have my function keyword defining the function. After that first curly brace, now I've got demos. We're going to go into all this so you can see real code. I just kind of have notes here, really. Oh, and by the way, uh, the slides and all the demos that I'm going to be doing tonight, uh, I'll package up and make sure to get to the guys, and then you can redistribute to wherever you need to, OK? Uh, so at the beginning, I have my comment-based help. You then have your commandlet binding attribute. I then have my set of parameters, which include whatever, whatever validation I want. Now we get into the kind of the meat of the function. I can have a begin script block. I have the begin keyword, and then an open and close curly brace. That script block is the begin script block. I can put in that script block any code that I want that will run once before any objects that might be passed into the function are processed. So it's kind of like a pre-processing setup stuff. I then have a processed script block, again, open and close curly brace. Whatever code I have in that set of curly braces runs once for every hyphen object. Jeff, on the begin, uh -huh. you always know, now it might not be the right time to ask the question. No, go ahead. No, ask does that time. happen once per script? But this is, we're talking about a function. So every so. So if I take so if I have a, all of a sudden I've got a hyphen. 
when we, when we finish this talk about end, and then I'll okay. describe it. And the end script block executes once after everything's been processed. So the way that this could work, the example I usually use, is let's say you have a function that <clears throat> takes a computer name, which you're expecting to pipe into it, and uses wmybot, query some information, and write it to a SQL database. So <clears throat> I'm going to do like get contact computers.txt, pipe into my get wmy data function. In the begin script block, because it only happens once, I would put in whatever code I need to establish my connection to the database, set up all that stuff. The process script block then takes the computer name, does all the WMI stuff, gets all the data I want, writes to the database, and then in the end script block, does all the close up, clean up of my database connection. Does that help explain how that works? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One related question. See, uh, before you do WMI, you would first need to check with the computer is on, with the, you know, when our is running, and basically testing whether you, know, you can connect using WMI. So essentially, that's kind of like initialization. You would have to do that, though, because you're going to do that per computer in the process script block. Yeah. 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 The begin script block doesn't, you don't access anything that you might be piping into the function that doesn't get processed or reference, really. So the try, you put it in a try catch, put it in the process so that right, you, you put it in try catch, yes, yeah. in the process. So in the begin script block, I, if I'm using it at all, and you don't have to, the begin and end are purely, are strictly optional. Um, if you are initializing some variables, maybe some empty arrays that you're going to be populating in the process script block, because you only have to do that once, those are the kind of things that you might put in the begin script block. Again, I've got, we'll look at some actual examples of, of this. So the parameters, when we get to it, <clears throat> we can have a parameter attribute. And in that attribute, we can define things like the position. I usually start at zero, although I think you can also start at one. So you can say, I want this parameter to be positional. You can specify if you want the parameter to be mandatory. <coughs> You can provide a help message. So when, which is in which I recommend, if you make a parameter mandatory, include a help message. So if they run the, your function and they don't give a parameter, they'll get the little prompt, you know, for your parameter value, and then do whatever the bang question mark to, to see the little help text. That's what the help message <coughs> is. Yeah. Can I stop you on position for a second? I yeah. see it in error messages and stuff. And I'm not clear on what position is or does. Position has to do with some parameters in PowerShell are positional and some are named. So, and we'll just talk about commands because we're talking about writing advanced functions. We're kind of talking about writing really kind of a command link, but in script. So with, um, let's say, get child out, you know, the dir command. The first parameter is path, I believe. <clears throat> so I could do dir, you know, c colon, backslash windows. PowerShell knows that, you know, more than likely, the first thing that you type after the command is going to be the path. Okay. So that parameter name is positional. I don't have to specify dash path. But then there are some parameters, maybe I should just bring up PowerShell here. And look at this here. Um, Who decided that a tilted podium is not easy for me? And, and a metal one at that. Who might be? It's really a test for the presenter. Let's see how many challenges we can get. Yeah.
So when I run get service, this name parameter, because I can get service spooler, and it would know that the spooler belongs to this name parameter. See how the name itself is in square brackets? Yes. That indicates that it's not required that you use dash name. It's positional. Computer name is not positional. So I can't do get service spooler server one, because it won't know what server one is. So computer name is not a positional parameter, it's a name parameter, okay. which you could also get by looking at the detailed help. When you come down and look at the parameters, you can see that computer name, position is named. And if we were to look at name, now in the help, and, and they, start, they start at one, I always start at zero, but it's the same thing. That's the first position. Okay. So you can have, let's, but I could write my, like my get OS function. I could write it in such a way where I want to have two parameters. I want to be able to specify the computer name and a credential. So I could make them both named, meaning I would leave off the position. So if I want to specify a computer name, I have to do dash computer name. Or I could just make them both positional. As you get OS, server one, dollar credit. And my function would not. Okay. What goes with what? So that's what I'm talking about with position. Thank you. We can also specify with that parameter whether we want our that parameter to accept pipeline input by value or by property name. Everyone understand the difference between by value and property name? So by value means whatever I see, I'm going to assume that I'm just going to use it. And then by property name means if I see an object with that property, that's the same as my parameter name. I'm going to hook those two up and bind that incoming object property name to that parameter value. And then I can also specify if I'm using parameter sets, this is where I would define that as well. You can define aliases for your parameters. You can define default values for your parameters. You kind of saw that already. Just Dollar computer name equal dollar EMB colon computer name. I like using default values because <clears throat> I can have as many parameters as I want and set the default values going to handle probably 90% or more of the use cases that I'm planning on using this function. But on the off chance that I might need to use something else or someone else, because obviously I write a lot of stuff that I share and publish. I need to be offer flexibility so that when you run it, you can specify value that works for you. So I use default values quite a bit. Now, one thing to be aware of, you, if you have a parameter that is mandatory, that you, you decide, no, I want to make sure they enter a value for this, and if they don't, then prompt them, you can't specify a default value. It'll just ignore it. So you either have to specify a default value or make it mandatory, or maybe throw in some combination of validation as well. 
And then I always define the parameter type, such as string, credential, <coughs> integer. I have one question. Uh -huh. uh, I've seen this uh, parameters by ref. Oh, the ref? Yeah. That's a that's a developer thing that there are some, and this usually works with something that is with .NET or COM, where just the underlying programming for that black box, I don't really care what it is, it needs that attribute, that object type, in order for it to work. So if you see that, if you read the documentation, you just have to do it. But that, that's, that's in a rare, I mean, if you're, if you're using that, you're really doing something nitty gritty with raw.net or com programming. Was there another question? All right, parameter validation. These are some of the ones. They're not all of them. The ones I tend to use a lot. Uh, validate not null or empty. That way I can verify that they have entered something and not just put in a blank string or something. Basically, just says not null or empty. Um, I like validate script quite a bit. In validate script, in that set of curly braces, you can put in whatever code you want. It has to return true or false. Dollar sign underscore will be the value of whatever that parameter value is. So in this case, my little <coughs> validation script is running test path, so I'm assuming that the parameter name is probably something like path. And I want to verify that the path exists before I carry on. If that returns false, PowerShell will throw an exception and say, can't validate on this parameter. Now PowerShell 3 includes some other ways where you can customize some of that output. I'm not, I don't have time to, I won't get into that. Uh, into that tonight. There's some recent examples on my blog where you might see that. And even though this is a one line, you can have as much PowerShell code as you want. Just hit enter after that opening curly brace and code away. But it has to write true or false. Yeah, it has to write true or false to the pipeline. Uh, you might want to validate a range. So they're putting in some integer and you want to make sure it's between 1 and 255. If it's not, again, you'll get an exception. Maybe validate a pattern using regular expressions. So I want to make sure that whatever string is entered in for this parameter, that it's in the format of some word, character, followed by a slash, and then another word character. And only that. Except I forget the little dollar sign after the second. W. You might also want to validate a set. So the only values that are good for this parameter are red, yellow, or green. And the mouse is going to generate an exception. So you can put this stuff in at the very beginning to make sure that they're putting stuff that is into the function that's going to work. I have on my blog, and I've got a link here at the end, <coughs> I wrote a, um, a PowerShell module that is basically a bunch of health topics that explain all of these validation things. I mean, there's stuff also in the help, regular help documentation, but I kind of went a little further. I did a series of blog articles late last year looking at all of these validation things, and then I took all those blog, ar blog articles, cleaned them up, and basically published them as a PowerShell module. It's like script, I think, I put a link here at the end, scripting help module or something like that. All right, so comment-based help, this is typically what it looks like. So I've got my function, my comment-based help, and then my comment bind it. The only thing that I would recommend you put in, at a minimum, are syntax, description, and an example. The syntax is just like you see in regular help. It's just a very short one line Description can be as long as you want to add a little more information. And then an example is, obviously just that an example. Yeah, if you look at my scripts, you'll see lots of ways of, of examples of how this works. 
you don't have to use parameter because that, that will automatically be put in with the help system. So when you do help get something on dash fold, I would see parameter information. But if there's more information that you would like to add, you can do dot parameter space and then the name of the parameter, like the computer name. And then after that, just type whatever text you want and that will be included in the help output. And do that for every parameter that you have in your function. Link, yeah. Did you, did you mean by syntax you mean synopsis or is there a different one for syntax? Oh, you're right, that's supposed to be synopsis. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I, I was thinking, uh, no, it's, you're right, that should be synopsis. I'll clean that up when I, before I send this to you, you're right, that should be synopsis. Well, why wait? <laughs> there we go. Yes, it should be synopsis. And you would see that when we get to the actual demo of this stuff. Uh, link can be references to other commandlets if you want. Um, notes can be version information, author information, whatever other information you want. Uh, inputs and outputs, again, are also purely optional if you want to indicate. Yes, this can input string. Usually just the inputs and outputs are put in just the object type that's a, that it is expecting. But those are purely optional. All right, so that's enough of me blabbing. Let's look at all of these things here while we still have time. See that outside's okay? okay. <laughs> so here's my basic function which exists in a script. So I just have the function name. Here's my parameter and I've given it default value. This is what was in the slides. So get them in my object. Win3 operating system is the class, computer name, and then I'm just writing the output. So in order for, for me to use this function, Right, it has to be loaded into my PowerShell session. I would understand that part. So the two ways that I could do this, one, if I was just in the regular PowerShell session, I could dot source it. So now I have all right, so there's my there's no real help there, but the help system still works. Uh, I'm running PowerShell version 3, by the way. <clears throat> Your might be a little bit different in version 2, but I don't think so. This is version 3. But now I can run that, and it defaulted to the local computer name. Or there's a parameter there. If I want to use I just hit tab to complete. I can put in another computer that's running on my little test network here. If I wanted to do a couple computers though, <clears throat> well see this isn't designed to take an array of names. No, I take that back. Apparently <laughs> <Surely> it is. <laughs> <Surely> it is. <laughs> I wonder if that's a version, I think that's <laughs> some official intelligence. The update. <laughs> I wonder if that's a version three. Oh. So here we're, here's yeah. what we're going to do. Let's. What? Oh. And it's not. It's not um, uh, yeah, this version of Windows 8, I don't have the necessary necessary bit, so I'm going to. So there's a little trick. So you can start up PowerShell for it, tell it to run in version 2 mode? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. You can also do no profile on the switches. Yeah. Um, I actually have in my profile, I'm, now I'm back on my laptop, I have in my profile, when I start PowerShell version 3, it also kicks off a PowerShell version 2 session. Because I always have to test stuff back and forth, so I always have a version 3 window and a version 2 window, and my version 2 window has additional code if it detects version 2 to change colors so I can tell which switch. 
Anyway. Um, <laughs> you do this too much. <laughs> <laughs> Programming the car punches. So I'm just going to copy and paste this function into function version 2. See, in version 2, that's what I was expecting. You don't get that full thing. They yeah. tweak things a bit. But I can run get OS. Yeah. So version 3, they are a little more forgiving. They help you out if you, to handle things like arrays. I'm going to show you how to handle more explicitly arrays. So why didn't he get anything because it was an array that was passed right. and it didn't right. have to do it? Yeah, because yeah, it treated basically that as one computer name. Right. And since it wasn't. They was not computer name I didn't. I didn't. I didn't uh, Finger anything, right? Just three so. years. Okay. Yeah. So what I would have to do in version two, if I wanted to basically have pipeline input, I'd have to do <coughs> for each get OS. Oh. No, we're not trying oh, yeah. to make any. Sorry. There we go. So it works that way. So in version three, is it essentially saying, oh, you gave me two values, I'm going to run the command twice? Yes. It's and not passing be, both in and your command suddenly handles arrays. Yeah. It's just saying, no, let's do them one at a time. Let's yeah, what, what's happening, which I didn't, which is new, I made a new discovery here. Um, in version three, when you give it an array, like I did there. You know, let's do all three like computers I have up running right now. Yeah, that's what I think. It's like an implied for each. It's doing an implied. Nice. That's kind of cool. I'd have to fire like trace command to yeah, see. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. start trace and stuff. To, to see what it's doing. Yeah. Um, because I, my command is not written in such a way. So, so run your trace command. I'm oh, actually, that. you know what it is? Um, get w my object. Yeah. Uh, PowerShell had three has made some changes in how it handles mm -hmm. arrays and deals with arrays. Did you guys know that? So if I have, for example, the Impulsion version 3, um, if I run get all my services and I want to get just the display name, I can do that in version 3. That won't work in version 2. Oops, sorry, I just did there. So it's doing something similar, I think, in my function. Just totally screws me up here. Killing my, killing my show, killing my demo. <laughs> but we're gonna move on from this anyway, right? So that's kind of a, a basic function. The pipeline processing that we were talking about. So I have a get foo function. So here's my command of binding. I'm not really doing anything with it other than it's there. But PowerShell will now, once it sees that, it adds things for me. We'll look at some other examples where we take more advantage of that. So I got one parameter, foo. It's a string. And here's my parameter decorator. So I've got the set position zero. Now, there's only one parameter, so that's really kind of irrelevant because it would know that's what it goes with. And this takes a value from the pipeline. Now, because of that from pipeline, you can also, and you'll also see it, there's nothing wrong with it. You'll also see things written like that, <coughs> equal true. But because it's true, just the fact that it's there, it's either true or false. So if you wanted to be explicitly say, no, I'm not going to allow this, then you can set to equal dollar false. So, so here's the begin script block which I choose once, then I have the process script block, and then the end script block. Now, in the process script block, you can reference, in, the, in PowerShell version 3, you can reference the <coughs> incoming object in a couple ways. 
<clears throat> you can reference it by variable name, such as dollar foo, which is the same thing as my parameter. You can use dollar input. You can use dollar sign underscore or PSI. And so I'm going to display all of those, and I've got different colors. So I'm going to run this script. In the ISE, everything in the ISE runs in the same global scope. So when I run this, it automatically is dot sourcing it. So now I can run something like get foo A. So there's the parameter name. Input dollar seven underscore ps item are empty because I didn't pipe anything into it. I just passed that parameter directly. So there's once I am the beginning process and then I'm ending. So let's do it this way. Let's take three values and pipe them into the function. So once again, beginning code happens once. Now, here's A, B, and C. Now I can get dollar input, dollar sign underscore PS item. So there's A, B, and C, and then my code that happens once at the end. Is dollar input new in version 3 too, or is that? I know dollar underscore is legacy, but and PS item I know is new. Yeah, PS item is new. I believe dollar input was in version two, but don't hold me to that. I've always used, when I was doing this, used to use just dollar sign underscore or the variable name. Because if I see dollar PS item, I still think. I don't know, okay, what is that? Is that a new variable name? Yeah, yeah so I, I would much rather just use my parameter name that is meaningful. And I, but this works because I've got this value from pipeline turned on. If I set this, well, let's see what happens here. I say I don't trust anything anymore. I'm going to fully test this in version three. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to specifically say that's set to false. So let's, I'm going to reload the function. This should still work, right? Because I'm not piping anything. I'm afraid this might still work. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. Okay. Yep. I, I wasn't. I didn't think it should, but after that last thing, I <laughs> having, having second thoughts here. All right. The import object is not bound in parameters because I haven't told it to take in pipeline input. So even though I have that process script block, it, it's not doing anything because I. Well, actually. What would happen if I were to comment out? Let's see if that will work. No, that won't work either. Right? So you have to you have to have the pipeline turned on other by pipeline or by property name. So that will work. <clears throat> Any questions on that? So that's kind of the basic example of how you know you set up pipelining in your advanced function. If I wanted, with this get foo, if I wanted to have it, well, since we know this is going to work now. No, it doesn't work. So that won't take multiple values as it's written. So the way that I typically do this, <coughs> and I want that, that I, I'm going to have to do some more experimenting. Here's my here's the second version of this function. 
The only thing that's really changed is that I have told PowerShell to treat Dollar Food to allow it to take an array of strings. That's what this other little nested set of curly uh, square brackets indicates. So everything else is still the same, except I need to be able to take into account how someone's going to use this function. They might run, you know, get foo dash ABC, or they might do, you know, get content letters dot txt pipe to get foo. <coughs> so I need to be able to handle both situations. So what you what you end up doing in the process script block is just add in a for each. So for each, whatever you want to call it, I like item, uh, in dollar food. If you're doing computer names, what I typically do, because I have my parameter name will be computer name, but then in the for each, it'll be like for each computer. So my variable names are still meaningful. And then in the for each, you can now use dollar item, or you can still use input underscore or PSI. So this function is already loaded. So I can run it like that. You can see it works. Or I can run it like that and it works. Although you notice you don't get the, because I didn't pipe anything in, but I was able to process each of those items individually. The big takeaway here, again, is you gotta think about how your function is most likely to be used. Will people always be piping stuff to it? You know, will they be getting information from a text file and piping it in? Or will they just be always, generally just typing just a single value for the parameter? Or do you need to try to accommodate both? You don't have to accommodate everyone, but think about how your function is going to be used, and not just yourself, right? Because how are they going to handle it after you get promoted to the big corner office, and or say, you know, I've had enough of this, and you guys are you're on your own. <laughs> okay. So let's look at an advanced function then. So here's my ghetto, here's my ghetto S, but an advanced version of this. So we'll walk through these things and then show this to you in action. I like putting up at the beginning a pound requires, either dash version two or dash version three. So if you are writing code that takes advantage of new PowerShell version three things, obviously you don't want someone to try to run it on version two, because it's not gonna work. In this particular case, the code that's in here, because I've tested it, runs about two or three, so I can say it requires at least version two. Hopefully no one is running PowerShell version one anywhere, but yeah, you never know. So here's my function. Here's my commandlet binding. All right. <clears throat> Here's my set of parameters. So I have, and this is the first parameter here, dollar computer name. It's got a default value, takes an array of strings. My second parameter is dollar credential. The computer name is positional. So, because so I'm assuming the first thing I see after get OS is going to be a computer name. Right? That seems logical. If I want to use a credential, I have to do dash credential and then provide a value. The little trick that I'm using here, which I learned from Bo Prox on Twitter and his blog, this allows me, if you want to use WMI stuff and have a credential, this technique here, oh, let me scroll over to the rest of it creating basically an empty PS credential. If I type dash credential and then the name, it'll prompt me for the, like the get credential prompt. Or if I have a predefined credential, I can just do dash credential dollar cred and it'll take that. 
So it's a cool way of either passing a direct credential or getting prompted to create the credential. And I don't have to do any of the other stuff I used to do, so I totally stole that, and I'm, that's a big help. Uh, I have an alias, and you can have as many aliases as you want, just separate them by commas. And I have a validation script. Now in this particular case, this is probably not the best place to put this kind of thing, but I wanted to have uh, a validation. So I'm doing test connection on the computer name, that's the dollar sign underscore, but just one ping. This works fine if I'm just doing a single computer. Where this doesn't work is if I'm piping in 10 computers, <coughs> If it can't connect to one, it's probably going to blow up the whole thing. It's not what I want. So I would probably, in a really production-oriented thing, I would put this testing more down in the processor <coughs> block and then more gracefully handle that. But I wanted to show you, you know, how the validation, what that validation script looks like. So in my begin script block, remember this happens once before any computer names are processed. I have a command here, write verbose, that's going to display the name of the command that it's starting. I'm defining a hash table, because what I'm going to do here is splat my parameters for get wmy object. So if there's a credential, then I just add that credential to the hash table. If there's not, then I don't have to worry about it. In the process script block, so here for each computer, because remember I can take a array of computer names, I'm going to add the computer name to the hash table. This is where I should probably put the test connection code. If you do put the test connection code up there in the validate, can you at any point write in if not test connection or something and into your code or? Is that like a mess? Well, no, I would, I would have to really do that down here. And we, and we, you know, we, we can test this. I, I just was thinking about this driving down that that code was in the, it's, it's fine for the demonstration of showing you how the validation script, but that actually test connection stuff probably should be down here. Um, so I've got try catch. Notice in the parameter, I put the error action stop in order for that to catch any terminated exceptions. Because even though I maybe have verified that I can ping the computer, what if I don't have access to it? So that I want to be able to handle that exception. <clears throat> so if I can get the data from WMI object, then I'm writing a custom object to the pipeline with the computer name, the operating system and service pack by basically renaming the WMI properties. Remember, my basic function just returned just the caption, which might be fine, but I like objects. I like flexibility. Because I can now take this, and it's going to write a, an object with these particular properties, which I can save. I could maybe pipe to something else and then just use the properties that are on that object. And you always got to think about how am I going to be using the tools that I'm building? If you're building a series of tools to kind of work together, think pipeline. And an object saying, okay, this command, this function is going to write an object with these properties. And then on this function, which is then going to take those things, I can use pipeline parameter binding. It makes things very simple. So my script then is, you know, get foo, pipe it to set foo, and everything just happens very easily. <coughs> uh, and then I clear <coughs> the data variable. And then in the end script block, after I've gotten all the information, I then write a little message. So here, let me, so let's run that, load that. So look at, let's look at help for, no, no, okay. Now, I do not have any help in here. But I can see that this is positional, right? Because it's in square brackets, takes a string, and it takes an array of strings. So those things from my 
help or for my parameter declarations show up here in help. And I don't believe So it does it does build does grab the parameter names and I do get the common parameters. So error warning, warning action, warning variable, dash rules, dash debug. So I can do get OS. It defaults to the local computer. I can do get OS. This is R1. Nope. All right. DC02 is offline. So I didn't get any value from DC01. That's where I really need to move that validation, that at least the test connection part, into the process script block. Now what I could do is, let's say I have a naming convention, and I want to make sure for my servers, and I want to make sure that whatever computer name is passed, meets that naming convention to kind of cut down on typos. Yeah, maybe I would just use a validate pattern then for something like that. This should really be 0 and 3, right? So that, it works that way. Remember that, those verbose messages? If I want to see them, all I have to do is just add dash verbose. When I don't want to see them, I can just run the command without it. So I use write verbose all the time. And I encourage you, that's going to be one of my best practices I'm going to go through here really quickly. Because um, you can specify, use write verbose to indicate what your script is doing all along the way. Use this as kind of your debug trace. So if you want to have a problem, you see what it's doing, all you have to do is just run your command with dash verbose and all those messages come to life. Yeah. In the, the header there for the parameters, did we ask uh, any other credentials in there, or is that not an actual? No, it's, it's there. Are you talking about in the help? I mean, I, I didn't use it. Okay, when you were running it, I was When I was running it, it right. There'd be, it's not mandatory, it's empty, but if I wanted to use it, I could. I could do <coughs> dash credential. I, I was expecting that that was the second parameter, not the... Yeah, see, I, I can do this. Okay. App. Uh, and I fat finger the, the the password. I get too many keys. So you can see that it failed. I was trying to create that credential. And this now also works going the other way. This is what I was trying to do. So I can also pipe stuff in. And those are objects, right? So I can do other filtering, do whatever you want with this, because it's an, an object. So I have a question. Yeah. I like right reverse. Do they have something for logging that's similar to that? Whatever you want to put in. No, no, I mean like logging to a log file. Whatever you want to put in. Um, not using there, there's right, a function. Not, not using write for post, but actually something specific. You know, what I'm getting. Well, you know, in version three, you can redirect right. the streams. Right. So you could do kind of a rough logging that way. Um, you could have, you basically, if you want logging, you would put in your own whatever you wanted to right. write information to log. Uh, on my blog, there is a function, I uh, forget the exact name, about like auto, if you do a search, I think, for automatic logging, uh, I wrote a function to try to help simplify some of that. But that's an advanced function. So now I have a tool. Actually, the only thing that's really missing is help. Let's look at something a little more complex. Uh, this is a version that's been on my blog recently about using uh, the SIM data file class in order to find files. So here's a help synopsis. Got, the, got it right. Description, parameter names, some examples. Oh, 
There's a little glitch in the help system for the, at least for the first example, and maybe this is just a way I like to do it. If you don't put in the prompt, it will add it for you, but it does it C colon PS or something like that, which I don't know, that just kind of bugs me. So I always, in my examples anyway, I always put in the prompt. Some notes, links, inputs and outputs. So here's my commandlet binding. Here's one way I'm using it with parameter sets. If an item does not have a specific parameter set defined, then it belongs to everything. So even though I've got one here default, which you don't see listed here, I really have two parameter sets, job and everything else. Because if you run this command with as job, you could also use throttle limit. But you really, there's no reason to use throttle limit if you're not running it as a job. So put them as a parameter set and everything else. So here it's mandatory and the help message, my aliases. Now this is not designed to take any pipeline input because I wrote this thinking all I really want to do is I might want to use this for security testing. I need to find the version of a particular DLL that's on 10 different computers. So I'm not going to be piping in, you know, lots of uh, file names. I'm just actually a single file name. So again, I have to think about how is this going to be used. So this doesn't have any of the begin, processor, and script blocks. Now this could, because I'm not really doing that, I could just turn this right into a script. I could just basically get rid of the function open here, this, the function line and the closing curly brace, save it as a file, and now it's just a script. In order to run it, I have to specify the full path to the script. Whereas if it's a function, you know, this is something I could package in a module, import the module, and then my function is just another tool that I can use. Which is why I tend to write things as functions. But this could be a script if I wanted to. So I'm doing some stuff here. You can read the blog article that explains everything that's going on. So to look at this, <clears throat> so there's my help. There you can see the two parameter sets. There's the description, there's my links and I have full help, there's there, there are my examples. You can, I, I didn't do it in this one, uh, after you put in your command, you can put in as much text as you want on the next line describing it. I didn't put any of that in here, but now it just works. And we're, I'm not going to walk through that. Um, Let me, last thing I want to show you real quickly here is uh, should process. So in commandlet binding, the other thing that you can put in is this supports should process. Like that value from pipeline, you'll also probably see a lot of people do equals dollar true. Or just that'll work too. Be careful, it's a little tricky. It supports should, so you got these two S's. When you do that, you have to think about what other commands are in your function. This will allow me, as long as I have, because I have command of binding, what if will automatically now be supported. How it's handled depends on what's in your function. So here's the first one I want to show you. I got this function here called remove data. There's a portrait process, this takes a path, and in the process script block, so I can pipe stuff in, and I'm calling remove item to remove everything that's in the path. Let me run this script to load the functions. So 
So if I did directory of my temp folder for files, selecting the first 10, piping it to remove my data, dash what if, Enter F8. Because remove item supports what if, that dash what if automatically gets passed down to it. So I don't have to do anything. So if you have a command, if you have a function that's using command that's using commandlets that support what if, I would encourage you to add that into your function. Better safe than sorry. Doesn't cost you anything. But you can also add conditional logic here, the support should process, like this. So here I'm going to take a, a path, presumably of a, of a CSV file, and import it. Well, import CSV doesn't have dash what if. But I want to, maybe I don't want to, I just want to check to see what it's going to do. So you can create your own what if, you need to use the and if statement, if dollar ps commandlet dot should process, and then in parentheses, basically what the object is that would be processed. In this case, it's the path. So when I, and then in that script block here, in the if block, so if this is true, if it's basically, if what if is not passed, then this code would execute. Otherwise, if I run the command like this, with dash what if, this comes, this line here, this comes from that if dollar ps command it should process dollar path, because dollar path is seeing work files at CSV. If I were to run that without the dash what if, now I don't know offhand, I don't think I have a work, I don't think that file exists. Yeah, that yeah, file doesn't exist on this. Computer. So otherwise, you'll get a line number on your. What if, you know, there should be like. Yeah, that line, that file, that, it'll work. Um, if I go back to my laptop. If I run this now here without the dash what if, this will actually work because the file is here. All right, so it just returns an object. There are 17 <coughs> objects. So without it, there's the, the what if. So if you want to add what if, do it. But you, that, that's how you would handle that. All right, let me go back. To any questions on any of that? And again, I'll make all those demos available to you. Uh, real quickly, some best practices. I uh, use commandlet binding. A lot of things you can do with it. Primarily, it allows you to get things like dash verbose and support for what if. When you write your function, and some of these are just general, hopefully common sense, but maybe sometimes it's also what I see out there. Use full commandlet and parameter names. No aliases. <coughs> One thing you need to think about, this, this came about in a discussion on Google Plus the other day. We're talking about writing, you know, how to write code. And I kind of commented that you should write code, write your functions, your scripts, for a future version of yourself that has total amnesia about what did I write and why did I do it that way. Well, well I do. <laughs> <laughs> have total amnesia. amnesia. So as all, you're all writing your script, you've got to be thinking about yourself six months from now who's completely forgotten everything. When you read your own blog and you're entertained, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wow, well, this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Who wrote this? Who wrote this up? So don't use aliases. Use full commandlet names and full parameter names. It may, because you only have, to, only have to write it once. And it's not very hard. You get tab completion in the IC and other editors. So there's no reason not to other than just being lazy. You're not awesome. that. Yeah. Use standard naming conventions wherever possible. So don't call your function Joe Bob. Assuming your name's Joe Bob. You know, use the standard verb noun naming convention. Now, 
I've been known to fudge a bit on the ver on the nouns. Sometimes I sneak in a plural, but try to stick to the standard PowerShell convention because you want your stuff to be discoverable. This also goes to parameter names. If you need a parameter that's going to be for a computer name, use computer name. Don't call it sys or system or machine name. Now, then we're back to the days of resource kit command line tools where everyone did their own thing and you have to figure out well, what's the parameter for computer name. If you see a parameter in another commandlet, use it. If it's the same thing that you use. So things like path, computer name. Now, yeah, Microsoft itself, there are some parameters that kind of vary a bit. <coughs> That's fine. Try to use common sense, okay? Wherever possible in your function, use commandlets. Yes, I know there's a lot of things you can really do cool stuff by accessing the raw.net framework. But those should be really the exception rather than the rules. If there's something that you need to do that there's no commandlet, fine, then use the .NET code. But don't use the date, time, object, and the, from the .NET framework and methods to calculate something. Use get date. Because remember, think about your future self in six months who's going to look at that .NET code, assuming that you're, no, that you're not a .NET developer, and wonder, what? Whereas you see get date, oh, well, I know what that means, okay? Include those verbose messages, those trace messages from the very beginning. So as you're writing your script, put in the right verbose about what everything is doing. It does a couple things. It helps you kind of organize your thoughts. And then when you need to debug or trace or figure out what your function's doing, you just run it with dash verbose and boom, there you go. Use validation. Test parameter values. Again, you want to have everything working and tested before you start getting into the meat of your function, especially if that function is changing things. Now, if you're just getting information and it blows up halfway through, I don't really care. But if I'm in the middle of copying files or deleting something or reconfiguring services, and it blows up halfway through, I'm not going to be very happy to have a half-configured system. So, protect yourself. Uh, try to avoid writing the same command twice. I'm trying to get better at this. <clears throat> I'm trying to use the splatting with the parameters a whole lot more. Because I used to say, you know, because a lot of the stuff I do, I'm wrapping around standard commandlets just making it easier, expanding on the, the functionality. So I would have a lot of code, if you look at my older stuff, where it's say, you know, if this parameter existed, then basically add the string, and or run, run the command this way, or run the command this way. Well, what I end up doing is writing the same, say, get to my object, I'm writing it twice. That's too much work. Write it once. It's, I guess I'm saying try to be elegant. Document first. What I always tell people to do, you know, I don't necessarily do, so do as I say now as I do. Um, before you write a single line of code in your function or script, open it up, <clears throat> then start writing as comments what you want to do. Test if CSV file exists. Hit enter a couple times. Import the CSV and save the values to a variable. For every item in this, you know, create this user account. And, and so on, whatever it is. Once that's done, then go back and start writing your code to fill in to meet those requirements. If you have other things that are going along, put those in as they come up. So this is two things. One, it helps organize your thoughts about what it is you want to do and how the best way to do it. And then when you're done, boom, you're documented. Right? We all hate writing documentation, but if you do it from the very beginning, then you're done. And if you want, you can, the right verbose messages can kind of serve double duty. And a big thing, again, think about how you're going to use your advanced function 
or who might be using it. If you're writing something for an intern or someone who is a you know entry level help desk person to do a simple repetitive task, think about how they might use it. What silly things might they do that you might have to handle? Because you want your advanced function to be as graceful as a command. All right, so resources. Um, if you're new to PowerShell, learn PowerShell 3 in a month of lunches. Tool making. PowerShell in depth is a PowerShell version 3 book. Should be out hopefully any day. Uh, Lee Home PowerShell Cookbook has lots of recipes of won't necessarily teach you PowerShell, but if you want to know, hey, you know, how do I, how can I do X? He might have a recipe in there. I've started looking through that and I'm learning stuff already. Uh, my blog, uh, I have a module called the IEC Scripting Geek that will plug into the IEC and adds a number of features like a little help wizard, um, saving a file as a script as a text file, a bunch of other things and my, there's that scripting help module I was referring to. Uh, my Professor PowerShell column, and PowerShell.org is the new site you should be going to. Lots of forums. Uh, they'll be also running the PowerShell Summit. So if you have working on something in PowerShell, whether it's script or interactive, Exchange, SharePoint, SQL, that's the place to go. Questions? I'm assuming I need to ask questions at this point. Was that useful? Oh, okay. yes. Very good. All right, that's what I need to know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's not really a question. Well, actually, there's a, this may be kind of a question you don't want to answer here, but like, you, you alluded earlier about how would you troubleshoot something, or how would you determine how something is actually being processed? And you said you would you would run. Oh, uh, there, yeah, there's a. And that's something that's often. Yeah, you know, that would make probably some good, good set of Professor PowerShell. Columns, uh, we can't talk in time. Start trace. Trace. Trace command. So there's a, there is a commandlet called trace command that allows you to kind of walk through. It's a kind of a developer, mm -hmm. it's my perspective, kind of a developer oriented tool that gives you, oh, sure. if you look at the examples, It starts basically a stack trace of when you run the command, all the stuff that PowerShell is doing. So it's a way of getting really nitty gritty. I'm not even sure I'd be able to understand because I'm not a .NET developer. Um, I'm an infrastructure guy for going way back. So I mean, I used to be a IT consultant doing you know Exchange, Active Directory, Windows Server. So basically, all the stuff you guys do. So you learn PowerShell by necessity. Well, actually, I've been doing uh, automation stuff because the days of batch files in DOS 3 trace. So it was it was batch files, and it was VB script. I wrote books in VB script. I somewhere along the way there were WordPerfect 5.1 macros. Oh yeah, and, oh, I was the king of WordPerfect oh, yeah. macros. Let me tell you, and I could turn out entire documents. Which is a few, <laughs> few, few items here. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, for the young guy. Uh, well, then there was word stars. Yeah, yeah there was word stars. Yeah, so I, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big proponent. Yeah, Basically, I like to tell people that I'm lazy. Yeah. You know, you I change your blog to the lazy. You, you know, <laughs> well, you, yeah, there actually used to be a site called the Lazy Admin. Um, but mine's lonely just in the sense of, I don't think because I'm lonely working alone. But you're sitting at your desk by yourself all day. Yeah. <laughs> We've already no, it is for, it's for people. The, the stuff that I do are for IT pros who really have too much to do, yeah. not enough time to all get it done, limited budgets. You know, if you work in a really large company, you probably, you know, those guys probably have decent budgets and they can afford all the management tools that they need. But what are, most people don't work in a shop like that. And so you're learning to use tools like PowerShell in order to be more efficient, you know, proverbial get, you know, get more done with less. So those are the people that I write for, and those are the things I'm always thinking about. How could I make this easier? 
so that you can get your job done and go home. I mean, my, my perfect idea is, you know, it's the corona system of management where I'm sitting on the beach, you know, in, in Mexico yeah. with my tablet, the Wi-Fi connection, and totally cool now because of PowerShell web access, and I can just connect into my network, I've got PowerShell web access, I can run a couple scripts and just boom, take care of everything right from the beach to in my Corona. I mean, that's, right? Isn't that the way? Corona, <laughs> sure. If you want to do it, so that, that's kind of the golden, you know, that's that's the dream. It just runs itself. Yeah. Corona. Then they, don't, then they don't need us. Yeah, if we're really, sitting on the be beach uh, managing our environment, they probably are paying Well, now. No, there's a different approach to that. And that is, if your guy can run your system by running on the beach, you should pay him more money. Because <laughs> he's the guy you want. Well, see, the... Now, the, the, that's a valid question that I hear. You know, people, especially like manager types. Well, yeah, I mean, they're already paying them to do their jobs. Well, the, the, the comeback to that is if I can do the stuff that I need to get done anyway faster, that frees me up to, to do more value add to the company. Now I have time to investigate new technologies. Are there other things that we can do to cut our costs? That, you know, so the whole point of all of this, that we're, why we're learning all of this, is to make the company money. By like being smarter, more efficient, being smart. Now sometimes there are some point of care bosses that can't see that yet. That's but it's our like job to try to educate them. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. I, that's where I feel like uh, a lot of middle management misses the mark. I'm a desktop support guy for the most part, stuck kind of in the middle of uh, an infrastructure type role and desktop support role. So this is something I'm learning on my own initiative to work smarter, not harder, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, but they want you to work smarter and harder. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're doing a lot every day and, and then um, when you're not being asked to learn this, but you're trying to learn it on the side. And it's, that much more difficult. Yeah, but if you, I tell people um, that if you are trying to like sell PowerShell inside your organization, the thing to do is find a relatively simple task that you do now manually, or maybe with VBScript or some a bash file or something, and come up with a PowerShell equivalent, which hopefully is much easier to do, and then demonstrate. Here's how we used to do it: how long it took. How long error prone, all the bad things about it, and look at the way we can do it on PowerShell. Oh, and by the way, this only took me 10 minutes to do, versus, you know. That's actually what I've been doing. I've been showing them, hey, look, I can do this and that with PowerShell. Here's a script that I wrote, and this is what it does, and they like it. Oh, yeah, when I show the WMI stuff, I'll always ask someone, you know, who's got VB script? And if you're doing that VB script, how long, how many lines of code would take you to do that same WMI? Stuff I can do with one line, I'm not even writing any scripts, just a one line PowerShell command can be 50 lines of VB script code. I just, that's already, really uh, just reading a CSV file. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does this yeah. sound like a good game show? I'm sorry? Can you do that script? <laughs> <laughs> I gave somebody like a four or five line script recently. He's not into PowerShell yet, and I'm trying to get him there. And I showed him like what would take him a page of code I did like in a little block just to create a folder structure and stuff as opposed to doing a VB script. It's like amazing. The other thing I do is whenever whenever someone asks me to do something, I send them the script that I used to do it for them. So that so if I ran some one line to generate all the list of users in some group, I send them the script that I used or whatever they still ask. The they side, do, but I like. The other site I didn't put on the uh, slide deck is poshcode.org. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to be careful just because something is posted up there doesn't necessarily mean that it's good PowerShell. That's a true Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anything that you download from the internet, even stuff from me, 
you need to run in a non-production environment, right? I hope that goes without saying. Um, and so I've, I always try to put a disclaimer in my code. I don't want anyone to come back and sue me and say, well, your script doesn't work. It crashed my Active Directory. Now I got fired. And I, I don't want to hear that. You know, you're responsible for the code that you run in your production environment. So test everything. Now we have all sorts of ways. You know, if you run Windows 8, you get free Hyper-V. You know, so there's VirtualBox. It's free. So it's not like you have to spend a ton of money in order to set up a quick little, even just a single virtual machine to test your stuff. Other questions? So here's my contact information. I also have a variety of business card type things you're welcome to, to have. I appreciate you guys coming on, coming down. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate yeah, you I drove down. down. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just up in Syracuse, New York area. Um, so if you did maybe hear that. And again, I do training. So if you guys, if you're a company and decide, you know what, hey, we need to get more in-depth training that would be something I'd be happy to help you guys out with. So, if there's nothing else, I'll formally conclude this, and then we can do little giveaway stuff and whatever other wrap-up stuff you guys have. Cool. All right. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.